Yes, I'm, I'm Christian. I, um, I love games. I've spent my entire life really with a playing games, making games, investing in game companies, mentoring game developers, doing things in and around games. And it's, it's, a, it's really an honor to be here, not just as a guest of probably one of the most interesting and innovative game platforms on the planet right now in the form of Roblox, in terms of where it's going, where it's been and where it's going, but also to get to talk to you and meet, hopefully, some of you here over lunch, some of the most innovative and forward-looking game developers, artists, and designers. You guys really are at the very cutting edge of where the game industry is going. So it's super, super cool to get to be here today. So a tiny, tiny bit about me first, and then what I'll do, really, uh, what I'll um, spend the next 15 minutes on is sharing some of my lessons of spending a career building game companies for the past 20 years. It's really more like 15 years, but what you learn in the game industry is everyone rounds up their numbers a little bit. So I'm going to call it 20 years of building game companies. Um, so, yeah, as you heard in the intro, really, what I've been doing for yeah, 17 or 18 years now is build game companies right at the cutting edge of where gaming is going. Macrospace and then Glue Mobile was at the very, very bleeding edge of mobile games. In fact, the company was created at a time when you couldn't really even download a, an application onto a mobile phone. And our first games were 65 by um, 96 pixels, black and white only, 64 kilobytes limit, file size limit for the entire game. So it gives you a sense of kind of where we started at the time. We have been super fortunate to get to build some incredibly successful games, have some incredible failures along the way as well. But what I've learned about myself during that time is I am not the best coder. I learned to code as a kid, but turns out I'm actually pretty bad. I'm certainly not the best artist. I love to draw, but I'm probably a worse artist than I am a developer. And you know, I'm a, I love design, but then everyone's a designer who's not a designer, right? So, so um, but what I do end up having really fallen in love with and studied a lot over time is game companies and teams. How does one build a really successful company and a team? What are some of the things that go right and go wrong over the, over the um, uh, life cycle, if you like, of building a product, not just a product, but building a company? And that's really what I wanna, wanna, wanna share with you over time. So with that, let me talk to you about first why I do this in the first place. Why spend north of, yeah, nearly 20 years now building games? And this is something that my mom still keeps asking me. She told me as a kid, like, you know, if you don't stop playing games, you'll never get a real job, you know? <laughs> she still asks me that when I bring the grandkids home over Christmas. Um, but the truth is, games are an amazing place to build your career. Games today are larger than any other form of media. It's larger than music, larger than movies. And it's larger because, and, and it's frankly at the very cutting edge of all forms of entertainment today. And because it is large and fast growing, and because it's at the cutting edge of both technology and art, both of which I love, it attracts incredible people. It attracts people who want to push the limits of animation, limits of storytelling, limits of machine learning, limits of technology. Limits of just what can you do as a team in the, in the form of media. So whether you look at that Ghost of Tsushima trailer, the, the Horizon Zero Dawn trailer, or this game, Vainglory, that you know, I've been working for the past few years, it is all about really pushing the boundaries of media across the board. And that is an incredibly addicting place to be working. Not just because you get to do that, but you get to work with other people who want to do that and who love that every day. That does not feel like a job. It's never felt like a job to me. It feels like a place to be able to do awesome things every day. So when your mom asks you, you know, when are you going to get a proper job, the right answer is gaming today is probably one of the most proper jobs there is. But, and it's probably more obvious to your mom today than it was to my mom when I grew up because gaming truly has gone mainstream in a massive way since, you know, since I grew up. But, so that's one reason why to be in games, because it's awesome. It's literally the most awesome industry you could ever work in. But the other reason is games matter a lot. Gaming gets bad press. Like, if you look at, like, recently especially, you read the stuff about, like, how, how playing games supposedly makes you go violent in, in, in real life or 
how gaming might be a mental um, health condition, or you know how gaming in general somehow leads to violence. There's a now, of course, playing anything 24/7 all the time is probably, or doing anything for that matter, exactly 24/7 all the time is probably not good for you, whatever that thing is. But don't forget, 20, 30 years ago when I grew up, TV was the big bad boy. Don't, you know, kids are gonna, the next generation is entirely ruined because kids watch TV. 100 years ago, 200, 200 years ago, it was fiction, novels, books. People are reading so many books that, you know, the next generation is ruined. So, but still, there seems to be this cycle in the human, if you like, history where the, every generation seems to think that the new cool form of media that the next generation has picked up somehow is gonna ruin them. And it typically doesn't. But more importantly, though, the thing that I've found that is really amazing that few people truly understand is how important games are in today's society. The homo sapiens brain is meant to be with a tribe, is meant to do things together. And in the modern world, digital media sometimes makes us very lonely and alone. Gaming is one of the only ways where people truly can discover their tribe, hang out with their tribe, be together in a way that humans need to be together. Whether that is within a family, whether it's me, you know, playing natural disaster survival with my kids or prison life with my kids, or whether it's my kids finding other friends to play those games with and hanging out for hours that way. Gaming is a really important way. They are sort of the, the modern campfire that brings people together. Incredibly important for society. Sometimes people can't physically see each other, but they can still be with each other through games, through games like the games that you guys create. So never forget when your mom asks you, because this is her second question, you are really talented, why aren't you out there curing cancer? The truth is you are curing cancer because those people in hospital who cannot go see their friends, who can't interact with their friends in the way that they want to, they can through the games that you create. They can make new friends. They can feel happier and better as a result. So never forget that the work that you do does matter. So with that, it's important. I, I find it really important. So anyway, so really quick then, five lessons of building game companies. These are, I like literally was in your, like sitting in your chair building my very first game company, probably about, yeah, 18, 19 years ago. And these are the things when I was trying to think like, what shall I tell you guys in like 10 minutes? Because probably you know more about game development these days than, than I do. But there are five things that really stand out. Firstly, the single most important thing to predict your success in the future in your, in, for your company, for your team. What do you think it is? Who thinks it's your idea, the idea that you have? Maybe some, not that many. Who thinks it's your technology, the technology that you built, the, the, all of that code that you have? It's not that. Uh, how about your art, the amazing character, the single unique character you've built? It's not any of those things. I think it's kind of obvious. But it's two things in a really weird intertwined way. And this is having observed lots of game companies, lots of things, teams that have done really well, some really massive failures that I've had personally. They really come down to talent plus culture, specifically talent density. It is never in a game team or game company about how many people you have. It is about what is their capability how passionate and capable and good are they at what they do, and how dense is that talent? It's much better to have three absolutely incredible people than 12 kind of okay people. So it's the density of that talent and how they work together. What is the culture? How are you able to work together in such a way that you can give each other honest feedback, that you can give each other energy, you can push a thing forward, you can you know, succeed together, you can fail together, and when you really fail, you can pick yourself up together. Talent plus culture is really everything. And a company, actually, this picture here is from the, of the Supercell ice hockey team. I think everyone at Supercell plays ice hockey, but, but this was some of the, some of the uh, original crew. Supercell have really demonstrated that a game like Clash of Clans or Clash Royale, you know, to some of their most exciting, best games and, and you know, certainly most commercially successful games, have been made by teams of like 10 or 11 people. Really small, but absolutely incredible talent. And even today, Supercell is barely 200 people. They're just over 200 people as a company that ultimately just got valued at $10 billion by Tencent. So it is not about how big you are. You might be envious of companies that have hundreds of employees. It's not about that. It's about the quality of your talent, and it's about the culture on how they work together. 
And this, by the way, is constant. So whatever your company is today, companies sometimes come and go, teams come and go, games come and go, talent is, does not come and go. You guys are here together. You will probably be making games. A large portion of you guys will be making games because it's very addictive. You will be making games in the next 10 or 20 years. You will only get better at what you do, and these teams will continue to morph in different ways, merge together. So it is all about tracking talent and figuring out how to best work together. So this is truly what matters. Even the worst teams, like, oh, sorry, even the, the absolute best teams in the world have terrible ideas. Like Supercell started off making a dystopian, futuristic Facebook MMO. That was their first game. That was the thing they raised some money on, and they very nearly failed until they found an investor that was prepared to just believe in the team and not in the idea. Team and culture trumps everything. Lesson one. Lesson two, and this is hard. You have to learn to kill your ideas. And I'm sure you guys have already done this many, 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 many times, but it is really a foundational skill. The second you think that you know which of your ideas is going to be great is the beginning of the end for you as a creator. Because the truth of it is that something like 70% plus, probably 80 or 90% plus, depending on you know, how active you are in creating things, of think ideas that you are convinced are awesome, ideas that you think are the best ideas ever, this is the, the best thing, still turn out not to work out for some reason that you don't understand or that you don't know. That was entirely unpredictable. Getting into the spirit of, hey, I'm going to test this thing. I have an awesome idea. I'm, I'm going to test it. And I'm ready to kill it if my metrics don't work out is in Incredibly, incredibly important. There are two decision raisers for this, and most of you guys, I'm sure, are already doing this. One is retention. The first one, it's kind of obvious that retention is ultimately your retention curve, like how many active users you have per day. Daily actives are a good way to look at it. Um, your retention curve ultimately determines your compound growth. The better you retain, the faster you grow. And frankly, if you don't retain, you will not grow. So when you look at a new feature or a new game, the first decision raiser is do people want to come back to this experience? If they do, it is awesome. If they do not, it is not awesome, no matter how awesome you think it is. The second proxy for it is engagement. How many minutes are people playing per active player? So the people who come in, how many minutes are they in your experience? And when you change that experience, do those minutes go up? Minutes spent or engagement is your best proxy for love. Do people love this thing? How much money people pay you is also a good proxy for how much they care about something. But it's not always the same thing, because sometimes you can offer something for sale where people felt that that was going to be really fun, but then they end up being really angry because they bought something that they didn't value in the end. Whereas time doesn't lie. People don't spend time in your game unless they love it. And this gives you a good second decision reason. When you have a great idea, Put it out as quickly as possible. Try to fail as quickly as possible by literally setting out your decision raisers. Probably retention, probably engagement. Could be something different depending on your idea. The third uh, lesson is how important it is to build lasting value. You may have an incredible game right now that's grossing you loads and loads of revenue, and you're like, this is the best thing ever. Every, every game has an arc. At the end of the day, whether you are World of Warcraft, whether you are Halo, whatever you are, it has an arc. At the end of the day, that game will come to an end one day. You should build it as big and as, you know, maintain it, hopefully for years and decades. But it's still, what you need to do as a company builder is not just to build a game, but build something of lasting value. And there's three or four different aspects to this. One is your team. More than anything, your team and your culture and learning to work better together all the time, attracting better and better people, making sure that your, 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 your team is amazing and that you can work together well. Secondly, tools. Do you have the technology and tools? Are you developing ways that you can get smarter all the time, that you can analyze your audience, that you can understand how you do work, that you can build, um, build things faster and faster? Are you building value that way? Third is IP. Things like Halo, God of War, World of Warcraft, even though any individual game has an arc that goes up and goes down. Have you built characters? Have you built a universe? Have you built a way of talking to your community? Have you built some kind of following that builds lasting value beyond that single game? So figuring out how you don't just build an amazingly successful game, but also how you can create lasting value through that so that you have a shot at creating additional successful games. And by the way, clearly, you guys who are here have developed something really successful. It's really worth internalizing and bearing in mind that game development, even for the best teams in the world, you probably have a 30 or 40% hit ratio at the most. Your next game will probably fail. That doesn't mean that you're any worse of a game developer than you were when you made your current successful game. It just means that you need to try again a few times. Because you know what? 70% of all ideas turn out not to work out. So that's why it's so important to be building lasting value 
and a way of you to be a more valuable company and a team as opposed to just building your game. Fourthly, this is probably obvious for you at this point in time. There will be a time in the future where it's not obvious, and then remember that I said this. You have to build things that you love to play. Right now, how many of you guys are working on a game that you love to play right now? The majority, that's good. If you're not, I, I, yeah, you should either learn to love your game or, or you know, you might be in trouble later on. The, the reason for this is that typically what happens is you make one really successful game in an area that, where you, love, that you love to play, and that made you make that game successful, you were lucky, lots of good things happened, and you have a successful game. Then you become convinced that I know how to make games, and then you're like, well, here's this other type of game. I've never really played that kind of game, but I can analyze it. I can figure out how to make that kind of game really, really, really well. And then you're convinced that you can, you can do that without loving the game, and then you end up trying to do it, and the vast majority of the time you end up failing. And the reason for it is that game development is not about big ideas most of the time. It's mostly about very diligent execution of a lot of small ideas and do them really, really well. And if you don't love the style of game that you're making, you're not gonna get those small ideas right. You may get some of the big outlines right, but not the small little things that players end up really appreciating in the type of game that you're making. So make stuff, yeah, that you believe will be commercially successful, but more importantly even, make stuff that you love. If you make stuff that you love that not everyone else thinks is gonna be successful, could be the future mega hit. If you make stuff you think is gonna be commercially successful, you don't love, it's probably a disaster. I certainly have had that because I was once that guy who thought that I can make anything successful. Turns out I really cannot. So uh, there you go. And then uh, finally, how many of you guys grew up or are from outside of the United States? A lot of you, that's super cool. How many of you guys, for how many of you guys is English not their first language? Yeah, a whole bunch of you guys. So it sometimes is so easy to either be from outside of the United States and speak good English or be from here to kind of think that, hey, I make my game in English and I sort of interact with my English community and that's kind of the, the world. Well, not really, right? The United States, less than 5% of the population uh, of the world, about, about 7 billion people, right? And uh, English is spoken by less than 20% of the world. And frankly, the by far the fastest growing parts of the game industry do not speak English. So. When you, it is, so being local, it's not just about, I know you're gonna, you guys are gonna hear about localization and, and you know, tools and stuff in that area, but it's not just about being localized and making sure that somebody translates your words. It's about truly thinking and reaching out and being curious about how are people in Malaysia playing my game? How are people in China playing my game? Figure out how to get into those communities, recruit community managers, listen. Find ways to interact and listen and understand how the game is evolving in elsewhere than in your English-speaking community. So you might learn some awesome things. And frankly, that is the larger part of your future growth. So figuring out how you don't just do the mechanistic thing of, hey, yep, I have you know, Chinese localization in my title, but rather, how, how much of your time every week are you spending listening to those communities to understand where your game might want to go? So those are kind of my five real key things. Think about your talent. Think about your, the kind of building lasting value with the, through the culture, the talent, but also the tech and the tools and the IP that you're creating. Remember to kill, measure stuff and kill them. Make sure that you're local. But I, you know, I have a bonus lesson because every game should have a bonus of some kind, right? And that is to, for you guys to get to know each other. The game industry, like I said, is attract amazing people, really amazing people. Um, and people tend to stay. The more you guys get to know each other, the more you learn to bounce ideas off each other, the less you are like, my game, I'm competitor with all of these guys and you know, I, 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 want, I don't wanna share anything, I wanna make sure that I just, I'm successful and I learn as much as I can from them. The more that you adopt an open mindset of truly sharing with each other, becoming successful together, gaming is not a zero-sum game, ever. It is always, if you help the platform grow, you help the community grow, you ultimately become more successful. And in your careers over the next 10 to 20 years, you get to know these people, you will end up working together in one configuration or another. You may as well start figuring out now who you want to work with and who you don't want to work with and where the, where the industry is going to go. Plus, people in the game industry are super fun. And I really encourage you guys to get together and, and, and enjoy the process because you truly, truly are at the cutting edge. Which brings me to my very final, final thought. 
you may have been attracted to Roblox because perhaps it was easy or it was a, an approachable thing or perhaps you were a player before you became a creator. One of the super crazy things about Roblox is how it has become such a thought leader. Frankly, how you guys have become thought leaders in the industry in ways that you perhaps don't even understand. What do you think is the most impactful game in the game industry this year, 2018? What do people talk about when they have their various game developer conferences and, and, and whatnot outside of the Roblox community? What do you think that is? Fortnite. Yeah, Fortnite, right? <laughs> Obviously, right? Fortnite, if you think of what's special about Fortnite, well, <laughs> Fortnite is a multi-platform game played on lots of platforms. Fortnite is a drop-in, drop-out game experience. Fortnite is effectively a mod, or the, the Battle Royale part of Fortnite is, is, is basically a mod on a previous game. It is super highly social. It is basically inspired by all the things that you guys do. The amount that Roblox right now, and Roblox developers and specific Roblox games come up in the broader game industry when discussing where bigger console gaming and, you know, and PC gaming and everything else is going is kind of insane. So by starting your game careers and game making careers here as one of the elite Roblox developers, you guys truly are at the cutting edge of the industry. And there truly is no better place where you could be. Your mom's never going to understand that, so don't bother trying to explain that to her. <laughs> but we know, and that's why I'm so excited to be here. And frankly, I'm going to be around. Uh, after this, I'm going to be around over lunch. I would love to meet some of you guys. Like I said, I love helping out teams if I can. I love, I'm a, I've been a pretty active investor in game companies and in other ways, helping out teams in any way, shape, or form. You guys are in an incredible place. You should, have, you should be proud of what you've achieved to date, but know that you have an incredible career in front of you. Thank you very much.